Condested Bones, Part 2. We've been looking at the book by Christopher Roop and John Sanford, Contested Bones. Uh, just published this last year. They have a website and you're uh, welcome to look at it and that will give you a little more detail about the authors. Um, the jacket of the book looks like this. Um, and there's a picture of Christopher Roop and Dr. John Sanford. In the prologue, we noted that John Sanford believed in evolution until around the age of 50 when he realized the impotence of evolution to create anything. And the impact of genetic entropy, or what you might call devolution, and changed his mind about the way uh, the world worked, becoming, in fact, a short-age creationist. And then he had cognitive dissonance with all the fossil evidence of man evolving from apes, and what are you going to do about it? And so he and one of his, uh, um, if I could maybe call that protégés, uh, set about to investigate what about all those bones? And the result is the book we're studying. In chapter one, we discussed the advancing apes icon, the classic one. The fact that it was uh, produced with very little fossil evidence to back it up. The evolutionary story, and we're going to come back to that at the very end uh, of this talk. Uh, the scientific method, which we'll also come back to at the end of this talk and taxonomic principles. How do you classify stuff? And uh, the splitters and the lumpers. And John Sanford and Chris Roop are lumpers. Now we come to chapter two, A Theory in Crisis. And the quote is from a paleontologist Bernard Wood of George Washington University who says, even with all the fossil evidence and analytical techniques from the, from the past 50 years, a convincing hypothesis for the origin of Homo remains elusive. Think about that. This is a guy who wants there to be a convincing hypothesis, but he says it isn't there. And then the chapter starts with Darwin's prediction. Darwin knew that if his theory of evolution was correct, the fossil record should show innumerable immediate, intermediate forms, reflecting countless gradual evolutionary transitions wherein species were continuously morphing into other species. That's the theory. However, no such transitional fossils were seen in his day. Darwin viewed this problem as a potential fatal flaw in his theory, which he openly confessed. Why, then, is not every geological stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which could be urged against the theory. <coughs> so, it is rational to say, well, where are all those intermediate species? However, Darwin said, but the fossil record is really incomplete, and so what do you expect? Maybe if we find more stuff, we'll find more of those. For Darwin's theory to be true, there would need to be countless transitional forms linking all forms of life into one single organic chain, absolutely required. Darwin predicted that the fossils of all, countless, all the countless missing transitional forms would eventually be found. It has been 150 years since Darwin's time, so if he was correct, there should now be a great multitude of transitional fossils. However, this has not happened. For example, the late Stephen Jay Gould, evolutionary paleontologist at Harvard, confessed. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record persists as the trade secret of paleontology. The evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. Now, when he says however reasonable, 
He was an evolutionist. He is simply recognizing the truth. Leading paleoanthropologist Niles Eldridge, who worked with Gould, and Ian Tattersall had a similar thought saying, 120 years of paleontological research later, it has become abundantly clear that the fossil record will not conform, will not confirm this part of Darwin's prediction. Period. They're promoting, They're promoting of course, uh, punctuated equilibrium. Yes, we're going to come to that at the very end. But why are they promoting it? Because it's the only viable theory, according to them. Although transitional links are generally missing, it is still widely claimed that in the instance of ape to man evolution, there really, really is very compelling fossil evidence that proves the transition. But are these claims valid? There is no question that since the time of Darwin, there have been many determined people who have searched for missing links between ape and man, spent their whole lives doing so. Bones have indeed been found, and some of, the, some of these bones have been held up as ape-human transitional forms. A casual examination of textbooks and mass media seems to suggest that the hominin fossil evidence is now abundant and compelling. In this book, we will show that the textbooks and mass media are misrepresenting the situation, and that ape-to-man evolution is actually a theory in crisis, as is not acknowledged by experts in the field. So that's why the title of this chapter, A Theory in Crisis. This book will show that the theory of human evolution has the following profound problems. One, the history of the field of paleoanthropology consists of a long series of bone discoveries, each of which initially appeared to suggest a transitional form leading to man. But in each case, the claim has either been debunked or at least has become contested. Not everybody is convinced. Not just creationists haven't been convinced, old age or, new age, or young age. The, uh, the major players in the field, most of whom are evolutionists, are not convinced yet. The history of the field has been a long series of just so stories, each story invalidating the story before it. Well, <clears throat> They missed this, but now we have it right. Until the next story comes along. As more bones have been discovered, the basic story has not come into clearer focus. Rather, the story keeps getting more convoluted, more confusing, and more contested. The result is an evolutionary tree that experts refer to as a messy, tangled, undecipherable bush. Undecipherable? This speaks of a field in disarray. Even the most credible hominin fossils, fossils are contested in terms of their place in the human evolutionary tree. There are only two meaningful genera, Australopithecus, southern apes, and Homo, human. There is no clear evidence of a transitional bridge genus. Now, we're going to look at that and see whether that's really true or not. But I will tell you ahead of time, they wouldn't have written the book if they didn't think it's true. And I wouldn't be bringing the book if I didn't think that their evidence was pretty good. The ape-like Australopith precursors did not significantly precede man. They appear to have coexisted with man until the Australopiths went extinct. The earliest evidence for, of Homo seems to date back to the same era as do the earliest Australopiths. And in fact, to an earlier age now. The methods used to date most hominin fossils, such as potassium argon dating, have been shown to be unreliable, and when different dating methods are used to date the same sample, the resulting dates typically do not agree. Therefore, assigned dates can be misleading and in serious error. I didn't expect him to, uh, or them to uh, pick up uh, and, and, and deal with radiometric dating in this uh, setting, but actually they have. And that's, that's an area that I'm somewhat familiar with. New discoveries in the field of genetics make ape-to-man evolution virtually impossible. And of course, this is Sanford's 
personal bailiwick. Furthermore, there is strong evidence that the deviant forms within the Homo genus appear to, be mani appear to manifest various pathologies, such as Erectus and Hobbit. These deviant forms do not necessarily reflect pre-humans, pre but rather seem to reflect genetic degeneration associated with inbreeding and accelerated mutation accumulation. Does the fossil record support the concept of ape-to-man ape evolution? The traditional view of human evolution has been pictured as a simple family lineage, something like the iconic march of progress illustration that we talked about last chapter, where a series of ape-like creatures become progressively more human as they march through time. At the time the image was created, evolution was thought to proceed in a straight line, with each ancestral species being replaced by the next. At that time, the thinking was that Australopithecus afarensis simply evolved into Homo habilis, which evolved into Homo erectus, which evolved into early Homo sapiens. Ernst Meyer championed this view in the 1950s and 60s, and it became deeply entrenched. But notice that Darwin's theory strongly favors that idea. However, over the past few decades, the picture of human evolution has changed dramatically. New species have replaced the species previously imagined to be transitional forms, and the idea of a simple linear progression has been completely abandoned. The traditional straight line view of human evolution is officially dead. Scientists expected that as more fossils were cataloged, the standard linear view of human evolution would come into clear focus. What has actually happened is just the opposite. Again, I'm not going to read the entire book to you. And where you see green ellipses, those are mine, and, they, and uh, uh, we're, we'll just uh, move on to the major points he's going to make. But I encourage you to read the book, because it's really good. Uh, paleoanthropologists now universally describe the human fossil record as a messy, tangled bush and they make no apologies for that description. Nearly every article that boasts of a new hominin fossil also claims that the new discovery will require a major rewrite of the human evolutionist story. Maybe the worst of those was Ida. Most people do not seem to realize that every rewrite of the story suggests that the story must have previously been wrong. But if the story is always changing, why should we trust the latest revision? Indeed, paleoanthropologists now widely acknowledge that the hominin bush has become so messy and tangled that it is not even possible to trace our evolutionary lineage through a series of ape-like ancestors. Most of the major finds that have historically been headlined have been later rejected by leading experts in the field or the paleo community as a whole. This includes the famous bones referred to as Neanderthal man, Piltdown man, Zinge, Lucy, Habilis, R.D., and Hobbit. Even the very recent finds of Sediba and Naledi have been quickly ousted from the direct human lineage. This list of de debunked human ancestors can be expanded to include more obscure species not widely known to the public, such as Australopithecus africanus, Orion uh, tugenensis, Sahelanthropus chadensis, and others. The status of nearly every hominin species in its hypothetical place in the human lineage has been subject to continuous revision. While some have argued that Habilis is a legitimate taxon, others argue, now argue that it is a wastebasket species and should be scrapped. It can be divided into two or more species. Erectus, Naledi, there, he's, she's, uh, and I should have put all of those are green, sorry. Erectus, Naledi, The Hobbit, Australopithecines, Ardi, Lucy, the, he goes over all of those. And Australopithecus africanus, Kinjanthropus platyops, or Australopithecus de Eurymedi. Others reject all of these Canada ancestors and instead confess that the origin of the genus Homo remains elusive, clouded, and totally confusing. What are we to make of those contested bones? Perhaps an ongoing debate is a sign of a healthy field of science. However, if a field persists in chaotically changing its claims and cannot firmly establish its own fundamentals, this is not evidence of scientific progress, but is evidence of confusion. I'm going to come back to that in uh, my next to the last comments. 
There appeared to be only one firm consensus within the field. The human fossil record does not reveal a clear linear progression from an ape-like australopith to man. The other firm consensus, by the way, is that it happened anyway regardless of the evidence. Strong doubts expect by leading ex uh, expressed by leading experts in the field. Textbooks in the mainstream media mislead the public by presenting fo the fossil evidence as if there are no serious controversies, suggesting that we know for a fact ape-to-man evolution happened. In reality, many scientists within the field question what the fossil evidence shows. Students in the general public are not told that the evidence taken as a whole looks very different from the stylized figures we see in textbooks. There's what you would see in a textbook. And you'll notice that everything seems to flow pretty well. And they're all arranged nicely. And they don't have little dotted lines between them, which is kind of interesting. Um, but, but they're arranged in such a way that you'd think that what we're getting is uh, a nice linear progression. That's the textbooks. Leading experts in the field are the first to acknowledge that there is a serious lack of fossil evidence in support of the ape to man story. For example, famed paleo expert Richard Leakey and David Pilbeam have confessed. Richard Leakey? Yeah. Biologists would dearly like to know how modern apes, modern humans, and the various ancestral hominids have evolved from a common ancestor. Unfortunately, the fossil record is somewhat incomplete as far as the hominids are concerned, and it is all but blank for the apes. The best we can hope for is that more fossils will be found over the next few years and will fill in the present gaps in the evidence. Wow. David Pilbeam right, comments, Riley, if you brought in a smart scientist from another discipline and showed him the meager evidence we've got, he'd surely say, forget it, there isn't enough to go on. But we have all the evidence, it's overwhelming. The extreme uncertainty regarding the lineage of man can be seen in a surprisingly transparent article of National Geographic, which showcases two charts on human evolution. The article provides a more honest portrayal of the fossil record. The charts are from two world authorities on human evolution, each with a competing view, Philip Tobias and Bernard Wood. Tobias's chart is covered with nine question marks at every major evolutionary junction. Wood shows 15 question marks, starting with the first link to the Homo genius and continuing all the way down to the earliest ape-like osteopaths. We really don't know how it happened. Wood published an updated tree diagram in 2014 in Scientific American. In place of the question marks, Wood now shows an equivalent number of broken, disconnected branches. He admits the picture has only become more obscure, more uncertain, and more convoluted with every new discovery. In an article, I, don't ask me, it reads in the original in a article, I'm sure somebody missed that. Published in Nature, Wood states, <coughs> even with all the fossil evidence and analytical techniques from the past 50 years, a convincing hypothesis for the origin of Homo remains elusive. That doesn't sound very confident. There's his chart. You see all the branches. You know, what, what is interesting is that he has branches that are pretty s solid for Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis and Homo heidelbergensis. They're related. But this one, this one, I don't know. This one, I don't know. This one, maybe. Broken branches, broken branches, broken branches all along. And what is striking to me and you do, you, maybe you didn't notice it when you first look at it, is here is a tree with nothing on it. The branches don't attach to the tree, but more importantly, the tree is vacant. Pardon me? It's the same case for biology in general. You have all kinds of uh, fruits, 
on the trees, but the, the main branches are notoriously uh, vacant. Yeah. There, there are there are a few exceptions, but yeah. uh, generally where you'd expect the most, you don't have them. Yeah. On the 200th anniversary of Charles Darwin's birth, paleo expert Richard Klein showed a tree diagram, um, figure three, which we'll see in just a minute, in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Similar to Wood's latest depiction, there are question marks and dashed lines at every major evolutionary junction. Klein's tree diagram shows that there is no fossil evidence connecting Yardi to Afarensis, no fossil evidence connecting Afarensis to Habilis, no fossil e evidence connecting Habilis to Ergaster erectus, and no fossil evidence connecting them to Homo sapiens, uh, Homo sapiens through an archaic immediate intermediate form. And there's the diagram. And you can see question marks all around. What, when, where. And those are his drawings. Paleoanthropologist Ian Tattersall, emeritus curator of the American Mu Museum of Natural History, now expresses similar doubts. Even allowing for the poor record we have of our close extinct kin, Homo sapiens appears as distinctive and unprecedented. There is certainly no evidence to support the notion that we've gradually became who we inherently are over a, an extended period in either the physical or intellectual sense. These honest m remarks expressed by experts in the field would most often be in private conversations or in obscure books. However, no trace of uncertainty is seen in textbooks of, or popular media. When it comes to the classroom, the mandate seems to be that the fact of human evolution must be vigorously championed, even at the expense of academic transparency. The controversial aspects of, about the hominin bones are largely hidden from public view. One is not allowed to question if ape to man evolution ha happened, only how it happened. It almost sounds like talking points. Uh, contested bones. In our investigation of this topic, we have found that every major new claim has been widely proclaimed to the public, has been challenged by other experts in the field. I'm sorry, that has been. In many, perhaps most of those cases, one of the competing views offered by paleo experts happens to line up remarkably well with our own alternative model. Maybe we don't have, you know, everybody agreeing with us. But there's certainly a substantial portion of the community that says, yeah, you know, we might be right about that. At least that's the claim that's being put up, and we're going to see how well it holds out. The competing views are not merely held by rare dissidents or eccentrics. Typically, it is leading authorities in the field who are expressing dissenting views in highly prestigious scientific journals, including Nature, Science, Journal of Human Evolution, American Journal of Physical Anthropology, Proceedings of the National Co Academy of Sciences, PLOS One, and more. Why doesn't the public hear about all the controversies within paleoanthropology? Introductory level textbooks and all the media have failed to present the controversy to students and the general public. This has created the false impression that paleo experts are in general agreement with one another regarding all the major claims. Well, they're actually in agreement with one major claim, and that is man came from apes. After that, have fun. This has given the public a false sense of confidence in the ape to man story. People may ask, how could so many scientists be wrong? They are unaware that there are competing views within the scientific community regarding the interpretation of each of the reputed hominins and the fundamentals of the field. In Contested Bones, we will share with our readers the competing view, views, which are largely unknown to students, the general public, and scientists outside the field of paleoanthropology. Our goal is to help people hear both sides of these controversies so they can make, they can better inf make better informed decisions regarding the important question of where we came from. In the next three sections of this book, we will examine in detail the bones of the eight primary hominin finds. In section one, we will examine the hominin bones of the human type, Neanderthal, Erectus, and Hobbit. 
In section two, we will examine the bones of the ape type, Artie and Lucy. In section three, we'll look at the bones of the supposed bridge species, Habilis, Sediba, and Naledi. We will conclude with an alternative model in chapter 14. The latest developments in the fall of 2017, a series of milestone papers were published in late 2017 as this book was going to press. They stopped the presses and put a paragraph or two in on each one, uh, and then you'll find it uh, dovetailed throughout the book in various places. The findings summarized below have profound implica implications for the ape to man story and call into question many major claims that have been made in the field since the 70s. These findings confirm that the ape to man story is a theory in deepening crisis and simultaneously confirms theses outlined in multiple chapters in this book. In other words, we didn't have to rearrange our story in order to fit all this stuff. That's important. Anatomically modern human looking footprints have been found in Crete that date to approximately 5.7 million years old. Some of you have been in this class about a month, month and a half ago. May remember we discussed that. This finding suggests humans significantly predate our reputed Australopithecus ancestors. Thus Lucy, Ardi, Sediba, Habilis, or any other Pliocene hominin species cannot reasonably be our ancestor because they could at, at most be our cousin. Greece's island of Crete is well outside Africa, the presumed pre-Pliocene hominin range, and so directly conflicts with the ape to man theory, certainly the out of Africa theory. Yet these findings are remarkably consistent with all our alternative model. Number two, Homo sapiens fossils from Morocco were assigned a revised age of 315,000 years. The Homo sapiens collection from Morocco predates what was previously seen as the oldest known occurrence of Homo sapiens. Skull caps from Homo kibish dated around 195,000 years old. This greatly extends the coexistence of Homo sapiens with their reputed archaic forebears or contemporaries, including Neanderthals, Denisovans, Erectus, Naledi, and Hobbit. We were there before they were. That means that it is as likely that they're degenerative us as it is that we descended from them, or ascended from them, if you prefer. A new paper in Nature, three, announcing, announced finding hammers, stones, and anvils in Southern California associated with processed mastodon remains, human butchering. These tools were assigned an age of approximately 130,000 years old, which presents a serious problem for the out of Africa theory. This is long before the reputed migration of early Homo sapiens out of Africa 50 to 100,000 years ago. Previous to these findings, the earliest evidence of humans in the Americas dates from roughly 12,000 to 14,000 years ago. Now, my personal opinion is that they used the wrong dating method. Um, the only one they could, for, to be fair, but they used the wrong one. Uh, well, actually, they could have used one other dating method, but they probably didn't do that because they don't want to. It's called carbon-14. You may have heard of it. Um, <clears throat> all the major paleoanthropological claims from the last 50 years are now in doubt. The modern theory is clearly in a state of disarray and confusion. Paleo experts can no longer be certain that the genus Homo evolved from the Austral Australopiths. They can no longer say, can no longer be certain. They never should have been certain in the first place, but we'll leave that out. Um, <clears throat> paleo experts can no longer, uh, they can no longer say when and where the first Homo sapiens appeared. They can no longer trust the techniques they have used to date hominin bones and artifacts, although they still want to. Bones of the human type, we're, we are now finished with the introduction and we're going to go to a very short intermediate uh, paragraph and we will start with Neanderthals next week. Bones of the human type, uh, in this Introduction to chapters three to five. Uh, 
In this first section, we will be examining the hominin bones of the human type. Because many paleo experts are splitters, there are many species in the Homo genius, Homo sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo erectus, and Homo oresiensis, uh, or known as popularly as a hobbit. However, most lumpers would say that all of these subgroupings reflect variation within a single species, that is, they are all Homo sapiens. We agree with the lumpers. As we discuss, the slightest anatomical difference is sufficient basis for splitters to declare the discovery of new species. Indeed, it is not unheard of for new hominin species to be declared on the basis of a single broken bone. Yeah, and there are examples. Now, lumpers are saying that uh, Homo sapiens includes many variants, including various people groups that splitters would call separate species. This would include Homo ergaster, Homo erectus, Homo georgicus, uh, Homo ancestor, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo rhodiensis, Homo helme, Homo oriensis, Homo neanderthalensis, and Homo denisova. There are strong arguments for lumping these slightly different skeletal forms into a single group. Number one, all the extinct Homo forms clearly display modern human anatomy from the neck down. Apart from some aberrant skull types, which have very reasonable explanations, all of these skeletons have a body shape that is clearly different. Uh, I missed uh, uh, correcting a, not technically misprint, but uh, trap, different from all uh, living apes and all Australopith-like fossils. This group is distinctly human in having unique body designs, this is number two, that enable highly optimized functions. As we will see, only humans have just the right anatomy to en enable graceful upright walking, deft handling of complex tools, inborn competence for speaking complex languages, translation, Broca's area in the brain, and inborn ability to think in a, hu in a truly human way. The human-like bone types are consistently associated with artifacts that disclose the cultural hallmarks of modern man. For example, they used and carefully fashioned tools, utilized fire, made artwork, ceremonially buried their dead, and could sail impressive seafaring vessels against an ocean current. And he, they're gonna back up all of that. These groups quite clearly intermated with each other and produced hybrid popula populations. Interfertility is the classic proof that anatomically variable groups still belong to the same species. That's how you know all dogs are still dogs. Continuing, I skipped a uh, paragraph. This first section describes Homo neanderthalensis, Neanderthal chapter three, which is what we'll deal with next week. A Homo erectus, uh, also known as erectus, chapter four, and Homo oresiensis, or hobbit, in chapter five. Homo habilis and Homo naledi will be described separately in section three, although you could argue that naledi belongs here but uh, that's how they're dividing it up. Now, my take, this chapter sets out the case that there is controversy over virtually every piece of evidence, including the dating methods. The rest of the book is documentation, sometimes in excruciating detail, of the extent of that controversy. The authors will eventually give their own proposal. It is not the only possible creationist, short age creationist even proposal but I think they will make a good case for it. Now, they do make a good case for the proposal, I think, but they make an even better case that the traditional series is untenable. I think they're doing a great service to the field. Even if their hypothesis turns out to be wrong, their database is still helpful. And they do point out some limitations of any reasonable hypothesis that one brings to the table. Now, whether that will be recognized in the next few years is another matter. One can always hope. Now, the comment about constant revision in the field deserves further attention. Philosophically, this is a sign of what is known as a degenerating research program. You have to keep doing ad hoc stuff in order to save the central core. 
A classic parallel is the degenerating phlogiston theory in contrast to oxygen theory. A lot of people don't realize this, but phlogiston theory was never proved wrong. Phlogiston theory could still account for all the data at what you might call its demise. The problem is, it was miserable at predicting further data. You could account for everything, but you couldn't predict with it. You couldn't say, and if you look here, you'll find this, and be right. Whereas oxygen theory required one semi-major revision in the middle of it, and just kept on making more and more accurate predictions and, and helping more and more to find stuff. And that is the difference between a degenerating and a uh, progressive research program. Finally, the Bush theory of human origins is okay, but we need to have a main stem. This is not always appreciated. Common descent requires that some population had continuous ancestor-descendant relationships between apes and humans. And let me illustrate that. The traditional story, of course, and that's the one that shows that progression, you know, with the apes getting better and better and better, more upright and so forth. That is the traditional story. That is what Darwin would expect. Now, of course, then it raises the question, well, what do you do about the, the other ones? That, why didn't they survive? Um, well, maybe they did. And maybe there were chimpanzees. Well, but how can you stay the same for six million years? Well, maybe it's gone in a little different direction. I've drawn it down, but it could be coming out of the page. Remember, this is Hilbert space, which is multidimensional. Okay? But I'm going to just do it in two dimensions because it's too hard to draw it otherwise. Um, okay, so that is the traditional story. And that's what you see in the textbooks at least until very recently. It would be interesting to see uh, what the fourth grade textbooks are still teaching now. Uh, now, the point is that, of course, you could have different populations that kind of merged at the end or something like that, perhaps intermarried with each other eventually. And, and I've drawn two, but there, there could be several of them. In fact, in theory, there should be about 10,000 of them that are very close to each other. That's the traditional t uh, story now. Um, and so it's not necessary to have an exact straight line, but it is necessary to have parents that have kids, that have kids, that have kids that eventually get to where we are. Now, again, you can have the chimpanzees survive. You can have maybe some australopiths that uh, survived for a while and then died out. You could have some intermediate forms from one branch or the other branch or one of any of, of those branches that come out. But without this central thing going up, you don't have evolution, okay? You could have something like uh, Stephen Jay Gould would, would imagine. And in fact, I think that this is not as steep as how he would imagine it. We're being generous. Uh, and of course, the nice thing about this is that if you were to populate this with skulls and then find a bunch of them, you'd find very few skulls in here and maybe not any at all. And so your theory is now essentially um, uh, safe from falsification. Because if you don't find it, well, that was the period where they weren't being buried. What you cannot have is, is uh, chimps, humans, and nothing come between. If you have that, that is equivalent to special creation. What it requires is if humans go all the way back, oh, say 5.7 million years, just to pick a figure, um, it requires that there is another branch before that that goes up. 
Otherwise, you don't have common ancestry. And if you don't have common ancestry, then you have intelligent design working, period. If that branch isn't there either, now you have an orchard instead of a tree. Orchards get planted. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. I, I just raised a question. Uh, you talked about the discoveries in California here, these uh, artifacts. <laughs> and um, said something about the dating method. What The date was how much? Uh, well, eventually we'll have to dig that uh, paper up and look at it uh, very carefully. Uh, paper dating is what, 150,000 years, something like that? 130,000. 130, What's 20,000 years among friends? Uh, it's. <laughs> uh, well, what, uh, what method do you use for uh, carbon 14? You can't do it. Well, that's right. It's not carbon 14. In fact, they had mastodon bones there. They could have dated those with carbon-14. They didn't. Any guesses as to why? Well, <laughs> it's too old. It doesn't work. Oh, well, of course, of course, of course. And you know what happened if they had actually done it? They would have found carbon-14. That's what everything else has in it, including you know, two million year old whale bone, it still has carbon-14. Can we say that there are hardly any specimens of carbon that don't have carbon-14 in them? That we know of? I think that's a safe thing to say. Judging from all of the literature I've been able to look at. And so what they did, of course, was electron spin resonance or uh, uranium uh, disequilibrium dating. You can't do this with uranium lead. It's way too, way too young. Or even, even, well, potassium argon you could. But you run into the same problem with potassium argon, as uh, they will discuss again, and as I discussed in my book. Um, you can show that lava flows that happened in 19... Uh, date to. He's a great guy. Wife. Oh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Yes. Jack. This may be the wrong time to uh, express a concern. Uh, something that those of us who've taught in this area of uh, face for years was uh, given the, the clarity of what seems to be the case, from, don't mean to use an oxymoron, but I think that's accurate here, the presentation, how do we, how do we fit this with uh, the picture of special creation we talk about and the role of humans or the, all of these other forms. Uh, I that, think it, that's I think, not easy. I think it's a fair case. Um, I think there are two things the, to be said about that. One of them is that it will help if we know more about the special forms. Uh, and that's one reason why I think they reserved their discussion to chapter 14 after they had been through all of the human, all of the ape, and all of the supposed intermediate forms so that you can see what you're actually looking at. Um, and then once they do that, then they try to put all the pieces together. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think right now what they're pointing out is that there are a lot of pieces that really don't fit with the standard uh, evolutionary model and they're not, they're not using well, here is what it actually looks like, and you know, uh, they are they are rather using, and this is what this expert says, and this is what that expert says, and mm -hmm. they and they all say, you know, you can't bank on this stuff. 
it's, it's unsatisfactory from one standpoint because science is not supposed to be authoritarian. And we really like to look at the, the data themselves, if at all possible. Well, the thing I was bringing up, and, I, and I'll stop with this, is the picture of God forming humans with his hand, breathing the breath into the life, breathing the breath of life into a right. godlike form that can then degenerate in all of these different ways, which seems to be the only other alternative. Or he, he specially created many human-like forms that aren't human-like. And that, that raises some very interesting questions if that were the case. Um, yeah. Why um, not? I, I have no problem uh, with, uh, with the degeneration. I think I'm not saying I have a big it. problem, but it's a question that we've had to face many times yes. and haven't found yes. a, an answer that would build a, a lot of confidence yet. Well, actually, we're going to run into some hints when we get into Neanderthal man. We're going to find out, among other things, that there was an awful lot of inbreeding. And we can prove that now. It's not just a matter of, oh, they look like they're inbred. You c we can actually get DNA and show. Uh, as soon as I, I think I can iterate what Jack has just said. And that's for those of us have spent largely our whole life trying to reconcile the scientific picture with, uh, with scripture without conceding to uh, what is pure hypothesis. I agree with the final conclusion. Here's a tree without a trunk, and trees don't grow without trunks. Um, they. The branches are all levitating, if you want to look at the screen. And, and what, force, <laughs> what force are you using to levitate all the branches? So I'm 100% in agreement that uh, this whole thing falls apart. It probably is not too difficult. Their book uh, won't be too difficult to explain that. But it raises the challenge, how do we, as creationists that believe God, uh, breathe into the nostrils of that first human the breath of life and we all came from one individual actually be precise too and later yeah. uh, <laughs> an addition of a second important part so <laughs> I don't want to overlook that um, yeah okay what I'm finding and I'm a librarian as most of you know and I read a lot of literature and creationist material the latest trend is to say, yes, God made, you know, the first human, Adam, and the first woman, Eve. And all of these forms are degenerate forms that could only arise after the fall. Okay, if we say that much, then we have kind of a uh, spreading out or radiation of different types after the fall, rather than one branch converging toward us, or several branches converging, we have a scattering, see, an upside-down tree. Mm -hmm. um, picture that, right. upside-down tree with the creationist model, and you have all the diversification. Uh, the big challenge will be, I'll be very curious, the big challenge is how do you relate it to what animals, creatures, or humans went on the ark, because we have only eight on the ark. and can you put all of these different types on the ark, and are they post-flood or pre-flood? That's going to be the big challenge. I, I won't even begin to offer a solution to that one, but it's something to uh, think about. It is true. Uh, the thing I think is that we actually have the tools to be able to start approaching that question. And, and that comes from the fact that humans are by everybody's agreement over 30% different from chimps. That is, 30% of the DNA that's in human Y chromosomes is not even in chimp chromosomes at all. The other 70% is 
rearranged completely, sometimes duplicated, sometimes just totally, uh, completely put in backwards. Um, those of you may remember that uh, our human Y chromosome talk. Um, that suggests that it would be really interesting to try to get a chromosome structure from some male Neanderthal. It should be really revealing, I think. Uh, if, if it's basically human oriented, then we're dealing with humans and we're just going to have to recognize that. If it's ape oriented, then we've got a, a huge problem. Uh, but uh, my own theory is that we should look at the data and see what it happens. Exactly. Um, predicting is always scary because you can't control the results. But predicting is the only way to really test a theory. To uh, complicate the picture that I've just presented, I'm finding a few creationists are taking the one text, I think it's in the middle of the Old Testament, where it says God made man upright. And so a characteristic of Homo sapiens is being able to walk upright. And all, all of the uh, creatures, including Australopithecus, are thus homo sapiens because they're, they have the gift of upright walking. That's a very literal interpretation. I don't happen to agree with it, but it's in the literature. And so we yeah. ought to at least look at it. We should look at it. The other question is, did Australo, uh, Australopithecus actually walk upright? We may be surprised at that. One thing to keep in mind is the people who are reporting this want very badly for certain things to be true. And sometimes they overstep the evidence. Yeah, I kind of lost my way because you already mentioned the inbreeding and so on. I think the characteristics of what sin is and how it has decayed all of uh, the um, humanity and all of uh, the other kingdoms, that I think is an area that needs an awful lot of research and I don't, I've never come up uh, across any researchers who have even speculated on that area. In other words, if there is deterioration since sin came in, and it would have accelerated after the flood when humanity was reduced to only eight, right. and we don't know how much diversity the three daughter-in-laws of Noah brought into it, but there must be a, a very rich field of study and research that would be helpful for oh, us, yeah. although I don't imagine that the secular yeah. researchers are going to go into it. And I don't think that we even have to start, uh, we have to finish with apes and humans. It would be fascinating because pigs are totally different from uh, apes or humans. Rhesus monkeys are totally different from apes or humans in terms of the Y chromosome. And remember, you only get one Y chromosome and there's no crossing over essentially. There's little, two little bitty ends that can cross over and that's it. Um, the rest of it is straight father to son, period. And the same thing is true, by the way, for mother to daughter in, in terms of uh, mitochondria. And it would be fascinating to look at, uh, for example, all the dogs, wolves, coyotes and stuff. Is their Y chromosome different enough from everything else to be able to say, yes, and here is a male tree, and then go over to the, the mitochondria and say, and here's a female tree, and you know what, there was originally only one pair of dogs that went into the ark. And after that, all the foxes, all the dingoes, coyotes, uh, wolves, you name it, were all, or maybe there were two pairs. And the foxes are by themselves and the rest of them are, you know. Uh, you don't know what you're gonna see until you look at it. But it's entirely possible that we could come uh, and look at it and say, there were actually one pair for this entire family. So you're saying what works best from a creationist viewpoint is the lumper model rather I than the splitter. I think, uh, well, no, that's... You hated to say that. That's predicting, okay? And I may wind up being wrong on that. 
But, you know, if it splits into three or four, I could live with that. That's still a lumper. <laughs> if, 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 if it's, yeah, if it splits into 500,000, we're in trouble. We are. Uh, comment back here. Two points. Uh, this morning I read about wheat. My father was a wheat farmer, and 50 or 60 years ago, there were, you know, two or three kinds of wheat. There was spring wheat, and there was summer wheat. Today, there are 25,000 different kinds of wheat, which says to me that there's been a lot of mixing and matching and all kinds of stuff going on. And is there somewhere in those 25,000 something that you could actually call wheat? Or has it been so modified that nothing is wheat anymore? Well, That's they all what, grow stocks of, you know, well, so high or so high or so high. Actually, they, they don't. You can eat on them. They don't. When my father was doing wheat, wheat came up to his chest. Today, wheat comes up to my knees. Wheat has changed. It's v anyway. That's that's point one. You I, I you am probably thinking still get wheat that goes up to your chest. Only if you can find some original wheat. They're not the, the, all the it, hybrid stuff's no good. <laughs> well, it's what you're eating every day. Um, <laughs> anyway, the point is, there's a lot of genetic stuff going on, and and from listening to all the conversations in this class for many years, I've come to the conclusion that we really don't know a lot about genetics, and we don't know a lot about things that can change, and we like to talk about it because it sounds really fun, and I'm as fascinated by it as anybody else, but we don't know a lot. Okay, the second point is, I read last week that in Japan, they are doing new research, which we can't do because of ethical concerns in this country, and that is they're taking human embryo cells from the brain of human embryos and inserting them into mice where they grow, continue to grow, and that's where the little blurb ended. At this point, we don't know what's going to happen, but it sounded an awful lot like amalgamation to me. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it does bring to mind certain comments about amalgamation, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> but it's, what a strange thing So if your mouse starts to talking do. back to you, you know it's a Japanese <laughs> mouse. <laughs> <laughs> but that was in a science journal. I thought, what in the world? <laughs> I was um, a very quiet, shy um, little girl in Chicago in a public school. And, and I remember the day that I brought my science book home and showed my mother the, the line of first it was this, and then this, and then this, and then human. And my mother was cooking, so she was busy. And I don't remember a lot of conversations about what was going on at school, but this has always stuck in my mind, and it was a long time ago. And she said to me, well, you remember that the Bible says that humans and the animals were created on the sixth day. Oh, yeah. So, we, didn't, we don't believe that. And that's all she said to me. But here's my second thought. I don't ever remember, and I, w I, I went faithfully. My mother made sure all four of his children faithfully went to Sabbath school every week. We never talked about creation, unless it happened to come in that series of the Sabbath school lesson. And so, um, I just took my mother's word for it and then, you know, grew in scripture and, and I, it didn't make sense to me that humans would come from a monkey. I didn't like that idea as a child. And I don't remember what grade I was in. I think I was maybe third or fourth that I would come home and say something to her. Um, our Sabbath school lessons I, and I'm, I'm not aware of the detail of our Sabbath school lessons for small children, but I don't know that we still are dealing with 
um, the issue of creation and the controversy. In, in other words, we don't have to be controversial with our children, but our children need to hear something about, we have a lot of children who are not going to church school, who maybe are not saying anything to their parents, who maybe the parents are staying home and watching church on TV, and so they're not going to Sabbath school. Sabbath school made me very strong. For a little public school child who was hearing all kinds, it was a predominantly Catholic community, even though it was a public school, I remember saying something to my girlfriend about, this picture isn't right, and she just, she didn't know what to say. Um, but, you know, she, she, went to, she went to confession on Saturday. That was, that was the most we had in common was that. We, we, <laughs> I went to Sabbath school, she went to confession. And <laughs> um, I'm concerned now we have a new Bible program coming out um, from the General Conference. And Anita, you probably know more about this than I do, but um, first graders will have creation up to Joseph. And then um, second grade will go from here to here, and then third grade will go from here to here. So a first grade teacher is not going to deal with a, a six or seven year old on, <laughs> on what's happening and what's coming into Adventism even. Um, yeah. And that's coming out next year. You know, we're not doing that with adults either. We are not well, doing that with Well, that's true. Uh, the fact of the I, matter is that this Sabbath school here may come close to being unique in terms of actually dealing with the questions of where science supposedly says your faith is all wet and you need to give it up and we look at the actual evidence behind that. I don't know, uh, there, there may be one or two other ones that have tried, um, but there are not very many of them. Most of the time, our Sabbath schools are, have dealt with, well, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say about that? And nobody says, and why should you believe the Bible anyway? Especially in our scientific age. Right. Um, I, I think it's something that really needs to be done, which is part of why I'm doing it. Um, uh, we don't do it for adults even, let alone for kids. We, we have to catch them when they're young, I think. I agree. It's, a, it's, a, it's that powerful time in a person's life. Um, God, there was something else yeah. I was going to say. To be fair, we have, we have started to build our own science-based textbooks. Um, they start at high school or they start in, 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 a, no, in we, we grade them. school? We, we have a new science book. In, in high school. So <laughs> we're, we're trying to get it that far, and, and I presume that you know, we're going to be working with all of this stuff. You know, there are other Christian denominations who, some of them anyway, uh, some parts of them are very sympathetic to us in this in this area and there is no reason why we can't you know be able to you know pull that kind of stuff together uh, you know one of the things we should do uh, maybe after we get done uh, looking at this book is to pull in the uh, the new Adventist book and look at it and see what it has to say and how it says it and, and uh, ask questions as to you know, whether it could be improved in some ways or, uh, and, and how it compares with the standard textbooks and so forth. Uh, it would be really interesting to see what, what the interplay between this faith science stuff and actual education is. Because I think it's important. It was just developed a new one four years ago. Because yeah. I, before I retired, I taught from it from about four years. And um, there, there was nothing on creation other than what I brought in. And I went to Barnes and Noble and bought a book so my students <laughs> could see the line and what their friends in their neighborhood were learning in the public school. Yeah. Because there was, there was nothing in our book. Now, that was a fourth grade book. So, and I don't know, I can't speak to, you know, grades one to three or five and six, but... 
there was a section about the flood in my book and a little bit about creation, very little. I, I think we need to do something like that. Uh, here and then I think we have one behind you after you're done. Okay. okay. In the years that I taught Bible doctrines, when we came to creation, I liked Ellen White's picture of things and I, I read that uh, Adam was more than twice the height of man today and I used to leap up on my desk and hold my hand up and to show how tall he was. I wish I could find a skeleton. There are some that were discovered and got in the papers in Ellen White's day. It's just that they, those were old newspaper reports which aren't reliable and you know, and uh, I know the YouTube's full of them. Washed aside. No, it's, uh, you know, and when Ellen White says it, she doesn't say, and Adam was twice the height, and uh, she goes on to say, and there are bones being found today, which already found. Uh, already found. And, and in fact, you can read it in the papers. Nowadays with the internet, you can actually look this stuff up. And it's there. It's just that nobody believes it. Because people weren't. People have been getting better and better. We're better than our, our ancestors. How can we, you know, look at the average height. And of course, you know, then you find, you know, seven and a half foot, eight foot people and you're going, ah, can't be. They didn't have Photoshop then. They didn't have Photoshop then, that's true. But they didn't have really, really good cameras either, so. And, the, and the, you know, basically what it boils down to is that we have to realize that there are narratives and the narratives exclude certain kinds of data. One of the things we're trying to do is to get back to the actual original data or as close to it as we can to look at it. Adventists should be very comfortable with that because that's how we treat the Bible. You don't take the Pope you don't take church council. You don't take commentaries, whatever, as the final word. The final word is what's in the book. And we should be treating the data the exact same way. What does the data actually say? And if it's not fitting into our theory, well, maybe our theory needs changing rather than the data. Anyway, go ahead. I would like to uh, throw this out as a suggestion. Clifford Goldstein has a book, Baptizing the Devil. I don't know if you've heard of it. I have. And his whole premise, I've only gotten through the first two chapters, is why are we placing so much of our belief system on science? And he goes through the history of science and so far, it's a magnificent uh, historical line that follows science and why it's not uh, necessarily reliable if it ever has been. At any rate, I just wanted to throw that yeah. out as a suggestion. Well, I, I would have to say I'd be, I'd be interested to see how the book approaches this, but I think that there is science and there is science. And that... Um, um, that you, because you believe that we actually send somebody to the moon, doesn't mean that you have to believe that we came from apes. Mm -hmm. points that out. Yeah. 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 Um, as has been pointed out several times, um, there is a real need for good in-depth analysis of these kinds of subjects and topics uh, that that has not happened in the past very much and that has been perhaps done only by people who had personal interest in the subject matter and they were doing this more or less in isolation how do i know that because that's what happened to me until i came to loma linda i was always 
thinking about this subject very much in isolation because in the grassroots churches there are not very many people who would have an interest in talking with you about it and if you start talking about it you find yourself very quickly talking by yourself <laughs> you know so do you know what a wonderful treasure it is that we have a group of people who are actually interested in this subject matter to come together and discuss this? Because this is what enables this examination to actually happen in a way that is broader than merely one person thinking about something and coming up with something, however likely or unlikely. Uh, which has its own dangers. You know, until I came here, I felt so isolated. I felt there was this real hunger to talk to another person, but to see another point of view, not just my own. You know, it's, it's like uh, when you've been alone on an island someplace for years, and you see another creature, you run in that direction as fast as your legs can carry you. Does this make sense to anybody? So, uh, this is uh, my long-winded way of complimenting um, Brother Gim on all his effort and many labors and much endurance with all of us. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I appreciate the compliment, but I will point out also that um, I am deeply indebted for this subject to Christopher Roop and John Sanford. Yes, of course. That uh, my hope is that the chain starts there, goes here, goes through here, uh, to the rest of you and your work and whatever, and then also on to other people who are interested on the internet, which is why I've consented to have it videotaped and it's videotaped in full. We don't do editing to get out all the little embarrassing stuff. <laughs> yes. Well, I really hesitate to make this comment, but I think it may be germane at this point. Um, perhaps very naively uh, since I had and we had, my colleagues, the opportunity to get to know our students well and talk openly about the pluses and minuses, et cetera, and where data seemed solid and where it didn't. Uh, I perhaps naively accepted invitations to go to church groups and talk about it. And I learned very quickly that unless I had all of the answers for all of the questions in a clear-cut uh, manner that would say this is all just ridiculous, I got classified with the, with the ones who weren't supporting scripture. And that was very, very difficult. Yes. And so I simply quit doing it because I didn't have the opportunity to have those people get to know me as well as my students did and trust me. And that in some ways has made me wonder if this sort of discussion can be had more generally. Or do we need to stay in small groups like this and have quotes all of the answers? <laughs> Okay. Uh, go ahead and then uh, Warren. In, in, in response to Dr. Stott, I, I, I think we have to start where we're at. Now this is the other thing, his experience has also been mine. You know, somebody reads somewhere something that I have not read or had an occasion to think about. And all of us, ah, you can't answer that, so you must be wrong. You know, the, the logic of it is like this. If you can't prove me wrong, it means that I'm right. Yeah. 
This type of reasoning, dear ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, cannot be more false. Uh, I, towards that end, I'm going to point out something. Okay, it's a kind of a, a generalized thing. And that is that, you know, Ellen White speaks about amalgamation of man and beast. And you can interpret that if you want as amalgamation of man and amalgamation of beast. Or you can interpret it as being crossed. Uh, and the story is told that Joseph Stalin wanted some really strong workers who didn't have enough brains to tell him that he was all wet. And so he tried to cross people and gorillas. You know? Strong, not too smart, that would work. Is this an urban legend? Um, the, now, here's the thing. I, I wouldn't put it past Joseph Stalin. Okay. Um, but if that were the case, the experiment was a failure because we don't have any of those around. There are stories with varying degrees of believability that there have been human chimpanzee crosses. Um, could that have happened before? And so I will have to say I am not an, abs an, an absolutist on this. If we find half human, half chimp, and one of the possibilities that has been proposed is that Australopithecus boise is human gorilla and Australopithecus afarensis, the, you know, the, the less robust ones, are human chimp. And what you're actually looking at is hybrids. Um, that is still a creationist hypothesis. It doesn't require anything to be changed in Genesis itself. However, it'll be interesting to see whether the evidence really does support that kind of hypothesis, the scientific evidence or not. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, if you were to find these in the right places, you could try to make some kind of a, you know, march of progress thing out of them. Uh, so what I want to do is rather than trying to tell you I know the truth and it's this way and you just take it from me because I know. Uh, I'm going to say I don't really know for sure. I have my prejudices, but all of our prejudices should be amenable to evidence. So let's see what we find out. I think these guys make a good case for there being a pretty clear distinction between Homo and Australopithecus. Um, is there a clear distinction between Australopithecus and modern chimpanzees? I don't know. And I think that we should be starting to look at these things from a scientific point of view. And now that we have discovered that DNA can last for maybe not millions of years, but thousands of years certainly, and that's a creationist hypothesis. Uh, it's worthwhile starting to look at these things and see what you get. And I think that rather than being rigid about this, we should be open. Sure. What did you find? And the interesting thing of it is when you do that for Neanderthals, you start, I think you come up to the conclusion that they're going to be fully human. I'm stealing my thunder from next week, but. <laughs> <laughs> Like, uh, I want to add a few thoughts to the last two speakers in the audience and I fully agree that we have some challenges with the way people reason and think. Sometimes our thinking and reasoning is off too, so I'm not pointing to any group. But we do have a mentality, especially within Adventism, and I've been a pastor, a mentality that as Seventh-day Adventists, we have the answers. And we have to have them. We have to have them. It's a theological quest. Yeah. And when it comes to scripture, when it comes to defending our belief in creation, the Sabbath, second coming, and so on, we have to have the answers. If we don't have answers on those basics, then people won't listen. So we've kind of programmed our laity to thinking that we Not have to have the answers. I'd like to give just one example of maybe 
what a challenge it is. I have a very close friend that got an Andrews University degree in biology. This is back in the 1970s. And he became a teacher. He taught uh, um, church school in Florida. I won't name any names at all. But um, he, he had a passion for fossils. And there was nothing in Evan's books. We've been talking about nothing in elementary books about even fossils other than to suggest, well, they're a product of the flood. But um, he got in trouble with, I don't know if it was the school board or prominent laity that had children in school. And the rumor ran around that my friend was an evolutionist. And so he started talking to various people, and maybe even the pastor, and explaining, well, I'm not an evolutionist, I'm a creationist. Well, yes, you're an evolutionist because you believe there are fossils. That was their argument, <laughs> especially dinos dinosaur fossils. You must be an evolutionist. <laughs> now, that's a very isolated case and a ex very extreme case, but we can multiply many cases where it's very hard to get beyond this idea that science is totally untrustworthy. Um, may I just quote the verse from Job? Who is this that speaks without knowledge? Uh, perhaps we should be less in a hurry to speak on subject matter we know little of. Amen. That's why I keep quiet. <laughs> and in the meantime, I think it's perfectly, <laughs> perfectly fair for us to look for more knowledge while, while we're confessing our ignorance. Anyway, well, yes? I, I have to add something to what uh, you just said. Because uh, uh, Mike. <laughs> the, the same mother who helped me with that picture in my science book, um, because I was living near Chicago, our teachers took us to, of course, the museums in Chicago. So I came back talking about these huge dinosaurs. And my mother said to me, well, what they do is they find bones and they put them all together. This is 1950s. Yeah. And they put them all together because she didn't know how else to explain to me about dinosaurs. And they make it look like those animals really lived. It, that was the best she knew to say to me. And that was typical. Uh, yeah, that was that. typical. Yeah. My missionary friend on the other side of the world said exactly the same thing. She was the daughter of one of the bosses in the general conference. Um, this is not science. <laughs> we have to wake up. You see, <laughs> we are living in a very exciting time of the world's history. There's no doubt about it. There is absolutely no doubt about And the church has to wake up. I mean, we have to so badly yeah. need to wake up. The, uh, to me, this book has three most important books in here. Daniel, and in the one extreme says Genesis and Revelation. Mm -hmm. We miss these three books. Might as well forget who we are. Yeah. We lose our identity right there very quickly. Well, come back next week. We'll talk about Neanderthal Man.